back on Monday, and remainder of, I got my suitcase back, so remainder of the AA uh, lab reports, and the quizzes you'll get on next Wednesday. So by Wednesday, I will have all, the, uh, up till Wednesday, grades updated on Moodle, so you'll have an idea where you're at before exam two, which is the following Monday. So I promise I'll get all of that to you so that you can see where your status is. Okay. All right. So moving on to carbohydrate analysis. All right, uh, I will hear from um, Tehu. All of the above. Anybody else? Emily? A and B. A and B. By the way, the other thing I want to say, email me if you participate because none of my wonderful TAs are here today. Um, so you can email me if you participate one, just in the subject, participate one time or however times. Um, lignin is not a carbohydrate. Well, it's A and B, yeah. <laughs> it's A and B. The lignin is not a carbohydrate because this is lignin. Yeah. And the monomers of lignin are not saccharides. So that's why they're not carbohydrate. These are the monomers of lignin. However, is lignin a dietary fiber? Yes. It is. Okay. That's, a, that's the confusing part. It's not a carbohydrate, but it's a dietary fiber. It's, it is present in wood and um, the solid uh, plant material, wood and barks basically, and it's not digestible. So if we ever consume something with lignin in it, it won't be digested, and that's why it is dietary fiber. Ha, huh, Peter. True? Sam, what did you want to say? Well, on what basis, you guys? <laughs> I mean, it's true, but <laughs> on what basis? Billy? If you do uh, initial reevaluation I'm impressed. You're very close. And you, once we uh, talk about this, you'll know that this is a very close answer. <laughs> very good. But before we go into that, and I, th I don't think I'll get to this part yet in this lecture today, What's starch gelatinization versus starch retrogradation? This is for chemistry revision. Sam? Water coming out. So what is starch de gelatinization really? Sarah? Yes, yeah, so it's basically your starch granule swelling and the water is, they're swelling because of water going in. Um, and the starch gelatinized, and then it can be digested. Raw starch is really a resistant starch because it can be digested. What about retrogradation? <coughs> and with amylose as well. So it is, after starch gelatinized, over time, it can retrogradate. So polymers of poly the amylopectin and amylose actually will crystallize, really will form polymers and crystallize, and that would be a retrogradation, and this is another form of resistant starch, um, and it's not digestible. And think about it in terms of bread. So when you make the dough, and the dough has starch and has gluten in it, and then bake it, the starch will gelatinize. And leave that bread over time, what's going to happen to the bread? It, yeah, it's stale. And the staling has to do with starch retrogradation. 
Do you remember the four types of resistance starch? Did you take that in food chemistry recently? Okay. So how many types? I said four, right? We already said two, raw and retrogradated starch. I think raw is type two and retrogradated is type three. There's type one and four yet. And, uh, yeah, so the starch could be gelatinized, but you the enzymes can't access it because the complex matrix, that's uh, star resistance starch type 1. Are you talking about the chemically, chemically modified starches? So um, those starches that are modified to become emulsifiers, for example, by attaching um, a group to emulsify, these are modified starch, so there will be resistant starch. More, more chemistry, biochemistry here. It's the role of carbohydrates. Remember your, yes, mere source of energy. What else? Don't hide. Megan. Dietary fiber, yes. So, so far energy, dietary fiber, what else? Can you think of others? Some forms what? Some are part of amino acids. <laughs> React with amino acids. So Katie, you said one word correct, amino acids. <laughs> amino acids and protein. So you have reducing sugars that will react with proteins and amino acid to form colors and flavors through the Miller reaction. What else? Huh? Added sugar. Yes. So definitely. Anything else? Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Glutamic, in, glutamic index, right? That's what they call it. Um, and we just talked about resistant starch, right? So if you have a product or um, a, a grain, for example, that has more resistant starch than another grain, it would be better uh, from a health perspective and glutamic index perspective. So let's see what do I have here. Oh, what, a couple of things, functionality we didn't talk about, obviously. So starch has functional contributions, viscosity, bulking agent, wa water holding. It stabilizes foams and emulsion because it would thicken the continuous phase. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if you remember, again, from food chemistry, when you talk about colloidal system, you form foam and emulsion, aqueous, let's say, in emulsion, you have oil in water, and then your oil droplets will be more stable if the surrounding is viscous. Um, same with the foam. The foam, the bubbles will be more stable and in place. Uh, take the bread, for example, the gelatin, starch gelatinization allows for those uh, cells, the crumb cells, to be intact and nicely structured. Uh, so very important functional properties for starch in particular. And for, uh, for dietary fiber, they add bulkness as well and water holding capacity. And then, of course, sugars will extend shelf life by lowering water activity. All right, so carbohydrate has so many different important uh, or important roles. Accordingly, why do we analyze them? Peter? Let's, let's summarize everything you say, nutritional label. Yes. <laughs> Julian. What's the shelf life? Like the amount of sugars lowering the water activity? Yes. Huh? Standard identity. Standard of identity or ma manufacturer uh, uh, procedure or uh, quality. Research. Let me pull that out. So 
ingredient authentication, compositional information, quality control, research. So I'll give you an example of in, in our lab why we do analysis of carbohydrate. So we, do, we, we don't care about carbohydrate as much as we care about proteins in our lab. So, but we do use carbohydrate to enhance the functionality of protein. So we take carbohydrate and we covalently link it with protein to enhance functionality. And then excess carbohydrate we don't want. We don't, we want to take it out. So we use chromatography to separate. And then we measure total carbohydrate in our fraction. So this is, this is an example of research where we measure carbohydrate where it's not our direct purpose, it's part of our research, however. Product development, like I gave you the example of resistant starch. So sometimes they want to formulate with a product or an ingredient that has higher resistant starch <coughs> than another ingredient and then look at the functionality, how when you change uh, the composition or the formulation, how the functionality is impacted and not just the health benefits. So therefore, we do analyze carbohydrate. And these are just examples. There are a long list of examples. As we go through the different analyses, we'll talk more about examples. Another quick refresher, chemistry refresher. So carbohydrates, they're classified as monosaccharides. Your monosaccharides are, can be hexoses or pentoses. And um, the disaccharides are like your sucrose or maltose, two glucose, one glucose, one fructose. You have lactose, one galactose, one glucose. Anyway, disaccharides. And then oligosaccharides, you can have uh, raffinose is made up of three monomers, stachyose, four. And maltodextrin can be anywhere from five up to 20, 30, 40. Maltodextrin is when you take the starch and hydrolyze it, you will get maltodextrin. You have different maltodextrin ingredients in the market for different functionalities. Uh, polysaccharides, you have your starch and dietary fiber. But again, remember lignin, although it's dietary fiber, it's not a carbohydrate. And the starch is um, made up of monomers of glucose, and if they are highly branched, they will be amylopectin. If they are not as much branched, they will be amylose. That's your chemistry. Dietary fibers such as cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, these are um, polysaccharides. Lignin is not a polysaccharide. It's a polymer. It's not a polysaccharide, and it's a dietary fiber. Okay, so here's the thing. If I ask you in an exam, what would be the starting steps prior to analysis, I'd like you to include homogenization and uh, selection of representative samples. If I ask you what, is, what are the sample prep steps that you would do, you don't have to tell me homogenization and selection of um, representative sample. You would just go into the preparation. So you have to be very careful what the question is asking you. Preparatory steps or what are the steps that you need to do before you do an analysis. So there are two different ways I can ask you the question. Okay. So if we're just talking about sample preparation, you already homogenized your sample, selected representative samples, and now you have to prepare your sample. So drying is your first uh, thing. So it is for high carbohydrate, it's very recom it's recommended to do vacuum oven so that you don't degrade your carbohydrate or initiate degradation or chemical reactions. So that's why we say here specifically vacuum because we do not want to lose any of our carbohydrate due to degradation or reactions such as Maillard reaction. And then if you have a fat, or in any case, we have to extract the fat so that when we are analyzing carbohydrate, there's no interference from fat. And often 
what common method is used is Soxley to just remove uh, the fat. So if you dry, then you don't have a problem using Soxley. So you dry your sample, and then you remove the fat by Soxley, and then you will have a defatted, dry starting material. This is the procedure you're going to do in the lab, determining total carbohydrate analysis. This is what you're doing next, this coming Monday and Wednesday. Uh, it's a very common analysis, um, and it is called the phenol sulfuric acid method. It's mainly for research purposes because you really um, want a clear solution and also non-interfering substances. So oftentimes it's used when you have purified solution and the main components are sugars, oligosaccharides. So that's why you will be doing total carbohydrate in beverages um, in lab. This is the method we use also in the, that research ex, the example I gave you in our lab to determine total carbohydrate after we do separation, because you will have more or less purified a solution. Okay, so what you're going to do in the lab is you're going to take a sample from a beverage and you're going to add sulfuric acid and a concentrated sulfuric acid. According to Cindy, this is the most dangerous lab. Why? Because it has two bad things. Uh, sulfuric acid concentrated and phenol, which is toxic. So, but we will make sure that you operate under safe conditions. Nothing happens uh, to you. Okay, so basically when you have your beverage and then you put it in a tube, you're going to add, uh, using the repipette, which I think he used in the Bradford assay, which, you, which is very important that you learn how to use that before this lab, you want to suspend, uh, to put about five milliliter or whatever of sulfuric acid, and this is the key point in the reaction. How fast you can dispense, and in the middle of the tube, not on the side, that will determine how successful your reaction is. Because that's, once you add the sulfuric acid, it's going to generate heat that is needed for this, this digestion, breaking down of glycosidic bonds, and then converting monosaccharides to furan, the heat and the concentrated acid. So your solution is mostly aqueous base. You add acid to water, this is exothermic reaction. So you're going to um, produce heat, and then the presence of concentrated acid will initiate the reaction. So the speed of dispensing the H2SO4 and uh, how you dispensed it is key in successful quantification of your total carbohydrate. Because the rate of the reaction is dependent on how you suspend or dispense your H2SO4. Anyway, so the H2SO4 will generate heat, your bonds, glycosidic bonds will be broken, you'll have monosaccharides, the heat and the acid also will convert monosaccharides to furan, which is really an enolization reaction. That means producing those double bonds, C double bond C, enolization, and dehydrating reaction, you also uh, generate water. Because you are forming double bonds, you are generating uh, water. So you get furans, that's the first product. Then, your furans, it's going to, we add the phenols. So the phenol, which is benzene ring and OH uh, compound, will react with your perforate derivatives or furans, will react with them to give you a unique compound with a particular absorption at 480, somewhere between 480 and 490. So in the lab, now you know how to use spectral uh, photometers, so you are going to determine the lambda max. That means the wavelength at which you have maximum absorption. So you're going to measure the absorption of one of your standards and monitor the absorption at different wavelengths to determine at which wavelength is the optimal uh, absorption. And then, of course, this requires a standard curve, so you will be using glucose 
uh, solutions as your standards. You will construct a standard curve, and then you'll measure your uh, car uh, carbohydrate in your sample, and you will convert absorption to concentration using the calibration curve. The one important thing about this method it's, is that it is not a stoichiometric reaction. What does that mean? What does a stoichiometric reaction mean? Remember that from your general chemistry? Or have you seen this term before? Yeah, do you remember what it is at all? Yes, so the quantity is proportional. So the, whatever you get here is proportional to the quantity of the substrate and that substrate. There is a re proportional relationship. But this reaction is not the case. And that's what makes it um, tricky. And that's why standard curve is very important. And the standard solutions should be made up of the main components of your, your uh, carbohydrates in the system. So if you have a mixture of glucose, fructose, uh, maltose and whatever sugars, oligosaccharides, it would be great to create the same mixture in your standards so that you have an absorption that relates to the sugars you have. Otherwise, your absorption, if you have fructose, your absorption of one mole of fructose with one mole of phenol, it will give you a different absorption than one mole of glucose and one mole of um, phenol. So that's one of the disadvantages of this product is that, of this reaction, is that if you don't have a standard that's made up of the exact mixture of sugars that you have in your sample, your results are not that accurate. Any questions? Sam? What's that? Say that again. If there were resistance starches, would they be proportional? Yeah. There will be no proportion. That's the thing. It's non stoichiometric whatever is the carbohydrate. The trick is if, if you know you have resistance starch and you know what type of resistance starch, then you can include that in your standard. And if you don't, then your quantification is purely an estimation. If you use glucose standard curve, your, your quantification is always an estimation and not an accurate. Um, determination. <coughs> and if your question was, would the resistance starch be hydrolyzed with the acid? Yes, it will be hydrolyzed. You will still form furans. Yeah? You can, you can still quantify it. All right. So, there are different classes of carbohydrates. So if we want to analyze mono and oligosaccharides, mono di and oligosaccharides, then there are different methods of doing that. Starch and dietary fiber, we'll talk about that as well. But if we want to know only the composition or the quantification of mono di and oligosaccharides, we have different ways of doing that. So there is the colorimetric uh, methods, or the chromato, uh, chromatographic methods and also enzymatic methods. Colorimetric methods are based on reducing cupric ion to cuprous ion. So it's basically reducing sugars. So you will determine reducing sugars using different type or different analyses. They're all related, they use different reagents, but all have the same principle, which is the sugar will reduce cupric to cupris ion. And all these names, Muji Nelson, Munson Walker, Lane, any, any non, uh, the people that came up with these methods. And then chromatographic methods, you have the uh, semi-quantitative, qualitative methods, paper and thin layer chromatography, and then the quantitative methods, HPLC and GC. So here where we go back to the principles we learn, but in an applicable uh, manner. So 
In order to analyze our mono dye and oligosaccharides in any food matrix, we have to extract them, purify them, remove them from everything else to avoid uh, interference. So you take your defatted and dry sample, and then you extract the mono disaccharides and oligosaccharides. So mono disaccharides and, and oligosaccharides as well, they are soluble in water, but proteins are soluble in water as well. So, but they're also soluble in 80% ethanol, which starch and protein and other polymers, they are not. So starch, dietary fiber, protein are not soluble in ethanol or 80% ethanol. So you don't have fat, you don't have water, then if you extract with 80% ethanol, you'll precipitate everything else, all the polymers that are still there, and just keep in the aqueous phase your uh, sugars, your mono dye and oligosaccharides. And so here's how you do it. So usually it's a reflux uh, setup. That means you have a hot plate, a water bath, or a beaker here with uh, water. And then you have your flask where you um, have your sample in the 80% ethanol. And then you have a distillation <coughs> setup. So inlet of water, outlet of inlet of water, outlet of water. So, and then you reflux for an hour to allow, uh, if you put it without the distillation unit, it will evaporate and then you will lose the, um, the, the system or the reaction medium. So you really need to keep it on for an hour without evaporation, so that's why we use the distillation setup. So after an hour, uh, your oligosaccharides, di and monosaccharides are in the 80% ethanol now, already extracted, and everything else can be filtered out. So you will uh, filter out, and then you will using the rotovap. So you, all of you know what the rotovap is. You've used it in the LCMS lab. So you dry the ethanol out, and then you would have your sugars in that flask, and then you can resolubilize it in your water, buffer, or any solvent necessary for the analysis that you're going to do. If you're going to analyze using HPLC, you might want to resolubilize in methanol, for example, or acetonitrile aqueous acetonitrile. So whatever you want to do next, you will use an, a fresh uh, solvent. And then your sample will be ready for further analysis. And here, one note that we want to make sure that the pH is neutral so that you don't hydrolyze any of your dye and oligosaccharides because you want to quantify them as is. You don't want to break any bonds. The Keras treatment is less common, and um, it's not really uh, shown in your book, but it, people have used it as well. Um, it's basically you use a Keras reagent that contains certain components that will precipitate, break emulsion, precipitate proteins and polysaccharides, and um, and absorb color, and what remain in solution after you filter everything out are your small sugars. But again, uh, this is not as commonly used. This is um, mostly the solvent extraction. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention with the solvent extraction is after you uh, evaporate the ethanol and resolubilize it, people do some purification steps. So if your sample has organic acids or salts or free amino acids that could be soluble in the ethanol, you run, you run it through an ion exchange resin. Uh, we call it a cartridge, a small like column-like cartridge that is an anion exchange. So because your um, ash and pigments and organic acids, they're all uh, charged, they carry charge, whereas your sugars don't. So you can get rid of everything charged that way by, by passing it through an ion exchange. Okay.
So the colorimetric method is specifically for reducing sugars. And the principle, like I said, is the reduction by the sugar, by the reducing sugar, of cupric ions in alkaline solution to cuprous ion. And the reaction with the complex compound to generate color. So here's the, oh, I thought the equation was here, but not yet. So the cuprous ion can be uh, determined either gravimetrically or by titration, and then it is proportional to the amount of reducing sugar. So like I said, there are three methods that are used. Um, I'd like you to remember at least one main for method. Uh, mostly Smoogee Nelson is the most common method. And really the difference among, they all have the same principle. But the difference among these methods is the type of reagents that you use and how you do the quantification. So try to remember one of them <laughs> uh, so that if I ask you the principle of the method, you'll be able to um, state one and state the principle. Um, so the quantification, like I said, is you either measure the cuprous oxide, which is a precipitate, a red precipitate. You can measure that by gravimetric procedure. That means weigh the amount of the precipitate. Or you can titrate to get the amount of the precipitate and then back calculate. Another way is to um, add a reagent, arsenomolybdate reagent, and we call that the arsenomolybdate uh, reaction, where the cuprous oxide will um, oxidize or reduce, sorry, arsenomolybdate, and you get a blue color and you measure absorption at 520, and of course you need a standard curve in this case in order to relate concentration of reducing sugar to um, the absorption. You have a question? No, 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 no. These are just telling you um, they differ in reagents and they differ in quantification. And you can tell from the slides, I don't want you to memorize. I want you to know that, that the, what the principle is and how you can quantify. So, wait, but to tell you, to remember one of the methods, would you have to know what the principle is? I would like you to know the principle. It's a reduction of cupric ion to cuprous ion and then uh, using different types of reagents, which I don't want you to remember. And then, what, how would you quantify? Yeah. Is that clear, everybody, what you need to know? Okay. All right, so usually here's the setup. Um, you, because of having cupric ion, so the solution will be blue, and then, um, once you have the reaction with the reducing sugar and the cupric ion, you will have the cuprous oxide precipitating and it would be a red precipitate and then you would have an oxidized um, sugar. So this would be the color that you'll see because of the cuprous oxide precipitation. And what is wrong here? When you, when you have when you end up with this rather than this. A very dark brick solution. Very maroon. Well, if you're measuring by, by spec, that mm. would just be cloudy because that's what the other method If we're measuring by spec, yes. And even if we are trying to precipitate, you really don't have a clear precipitate here. So what went wrong? What, what, why do we have? that strong of a color, yeah? No, it's simpler than that. Go ahead, I'm gonna go with, oh. We need a dilution, thank you. We need, we have, we did not dilute our sugar solution, it's just there was so much reducing sugar, you ended up with a very dark color and uh, you don't see a clear precipitation. If you're doing absorption, that's also gonna be a potential problem. So this is just an illustration that oftentimes we just need to dilute our samples, okay? Which you will be diluting your samples as well. 
This is, I just noticed, I don't know why I have this question. I just say for reducing sugar and then I ask you, what kind of sugar? It's like, what was I thinking? Um, you never know sometimes. Can, how can we analyze sucrose though? Is sucrose a reducing sugar? No, it doesn't have a free carbonyl at the end um, here. You don't have that free carbonyl here. So because you have a, a fructose. Um, How? Close? What were you going to say? With enzyme? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can use chromatography, but if we want to use this method. Oh. <laughs> yes, okay, I <laughs> see. That's the, most, the easier route than trying to um, get invertase and work with that. Um, so yeah, it's simple, just 2% HCl, heat it up, five minutes, you, bro you break the glycosidic bond, you have glucose and fructose, both now has free carbonyl, and you can um, determine the reducing sugars, and back calculate to sucrose concentration. Enzymatic method, it's also mostly used for monodi and oligosaccharide, but we use enzymatic methods for starch and dietary fiber, which we will talk about next time. But enzymatic methods, there are popular methods in general for carbohydrate analysis. You almost see them everywhere when it's related to carbohydrate analysis. Um, so from your food chemistry as well. Did you get to enzyme lecture in food chem? Were well, you on it? <laughs> Good. Uh, so there are proteins with powerful catalytic activity. That means they lower your activation energy and move the reaction fast. And they have very high specificity most of the time. And then, um, and then for both compound to be converted and the type of the reaction. So if it is a hydrolysis reaction versus um, dehydrogenase reaction, dehydrogenation reaction or decarboxylation or whatever is the reaction, they have specificity for it. Okay. So often they are used to determine the concentration of food constituents. So the total glucose, for example, lactose, malic acid. Uh, so they are used for that constituents concentration. Um, often, if not always, it is a determination by spectrophotometric method. So that means you generate your reactants or the products absorb light. And then you measure either the products or the reactants, or the absorption of the reactants. Um, since it's spectrophotometric, we need to clarify the solution in all cases and prevent presence of enzyme inhibitors, which is not very, depends on the food matrix you're working with. Um, sometimes you have to do two equations, two not equations, sorry, two chemical reactions with two different enzymes to get to your uh, absorption. So the first reaction, which we call the auxiliary reaction or the measuring rea reaction, you have your constituents, the food constituent that you care about, you react it with a certain uh, reactant substrate, another substrate. And then you have an enzyme here. You get two products. You take this one product and react it with another reactant. And we call this the indicator reaction because either C will absorb or R or S, two products, will absorb. And that's what you will monitor. If you're monitoring C, your absorption will, will decrease as P concentration increases, right? Because you will have more reaction, P and C, and you get these two products and then the absorption will go lower. 
if you are measuring the absorption of R or S, as the concentration of P increases, the absorption will increase, okay, depending on what, what, which ones of the reactants or the products absorb light, then you can relate it would be either a negative uh, proportion or a positive proportion, proportionality or whatever you call it. So here's an example for if we're measuring glucose. So ATP is your B reactant, and then hexokinase will allow the attachment of a phosphate, phosphate group from adenine triphosphate. You will get a glucose 6-phosphate. Phosphate will be at position 6 of the glucose. And then neither of these absorb light, so we're not done. So we take glucose 6-phosphate and another reactant, and we add another enzyme, which is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which will uh, make this lose hydrogen. So you will end up with 6-phosphogluconate, and ADPH, and H+. So this has lost, this lost two hydrogens, and that's the resultant uh, products. So, and you monitor absorption around the region 340. You see that NADPH absorb light, whereas NAD does not in this region, okay? If you measure at 260, for example, both will absorb. You don't want that. So you move away and measure absorption, even as it is not the lambda max for this one, but to avoid interference, here's your spectroscopy review, to avoid interference with, another, with this, you measure in this region. And then you can back calculate and determine glucose, but definitely you need a standard curve to do that. So, huh. Yeah, we add, we add all the reagents, yeah. We add ATP, we add the NADP, we add the two enzymes. NADPH will measure at 340 in this case. So we're measuring this product in this case. Yes, click on. Yes, it's this one. It's the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, so a couple more slides. I'll let you go. We have one minute. Um, example application, monosaccharides. There are assays that you can determine the concentration of each individually. Lactose, maltose, sucrose, there are assays for those in particular. These are obviously not mono and di, uh, but it's just giving you a heads up that we can also measure amylose, amylopectin, total starch, total dietary fiber, as well using enzyme assays. And we'll get to that. Because the, the reason I have it here is you hydrolyze amylose, amylopectin, you get glucose, and then glucose you use the previous uh, assay or another assay to determine its concentration. There are advantages and disadvantages, specific, Kits available commercially have very low detection limits, so very sensitive. Disadvantages because you measure absorption, there could be interference, so we want to make sure we're, we're selecting the right wavelength. And not always specific, so you might have an enzyme that can hydrolyze lactose and maltose at the same time, so it gets really tricky if you have these two different types of sugars in there. Okay. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.